thing you've been putting off. Maybe you say, someday I'll do that, or when I have more time. Whether the item is a big bucket list item or something smaller like going on a hike, now is the time to start your Say Yes list. And we have the perfect process to help you turn these items into reality. Join thousands of others with our free Say Yes list template at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. It'll help you stop living in that someday and start making those list items come true today. So download it now at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash list. Welcome to the Say Yes Experience podcast, where we inspire you to get out of your comfort zone and into possibility. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. If you're new here, welcome. We're thrilled you're here. I'm Just Corrector. I co-founded the Say Yes Experience with my then nine-year-old son, Blaze, based off his idea to let's just say yes to things. I'm one of the top experts on burnout, and companies and conferences hire me to present on mental health, wellness, and burnout prevention. As a number one best-selling author of 11 books, keynote speaker, and a burnout specialist, I've seen so much with our clients. The Say Yes experience was started to help you really start living, to do the things that light you up, have more fun, and turn your dreams of what we call Say Yes list items into reality. So thank you for investing in yourself and being here. Now let's make it happen. She was told she'd never finish school. Then she was told college wasn't for her. Then she heard that it would be too hard for someone like her to find a job. With a disability, Michelle Steiner proved others wrong time and time again. And now she wants to set the record straight. No matter what others tell you, no matter what life throws at you, you can do it. Whatever it is to you. You can go to school. You can get the job you want. You can live the life you desire. Don't listen to others who tell you you can't. Because when you listen to yourself and say yes to what you want, anything is probable. So please help me welcome my guest today, Michelle Steiner. Michelle, welcome to the show. We are so excited you are here. So you have a disability. So tell us a little bit about that and how you've used that to create really, really amazing opportunities in your life. Sure, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'd be happy to tell you. My name is Michelle Steiner, and I have a learning disability. My learning disability is dyscalculia or dyscalculia, depending on how you pronounce it, and it's a math-based learning disability. I also have visual perception issues, and I also have limited hand dexterity. And a lot of some of the issues that I I, I have, I have been able to turn them into things that can help other people. I work as a teacher's aide in the school and get that opportunity to give back and help students that have disabilities to be able to be successful in their school and hopefully to take some skills to take over their life as an adult. And I also work as a disability writer and photographer, and I have my own blog, and I've had disability articles published as well. I love it, Michelle. So let's kind of peel back the onion, if you will, and kind of unpack that. So when did your first disability kind of come to light? When did you find out about it? They found out I had a learning disability when I was in kindergarten. Uh, My preschool teacher even thought before kindergarten that there just was something off about my development and my learning. I was my parents' first child, though, so they didn't know a whole lot what to base uh, development on, so they sent me to kindergarten, and sure enough, when I was in kindergarten, I was struggling with things like tying my shoes and catching a ball and reading, and math has always been the big one, <laughs> and and sure enough, uh, I was tested for having a learning disability, and they, they found out that that's when I had, I had one, and when I went to school, though, during the, that time period, they didn't give a specific learning disability. It was more of just an umbrella term. Okay. And then how did that impact you while you were in, in school, especially in kindergarten, when you're just really starting to kind of get right. into school and learning that environment and that kind of stuff? Well, I had to uh, finish kindergarten. We had to repeat it the following year at a different school in our district, and I began to receive specialty services in all areas. And it was really uh, difficult for me. I can remember just thinking that learning was always going to be really hard. 
And I just didn't, I wasn't good at anything. I just couldn't do it. And so I struggled uh, academically. And I also struggled socially as well. It was hard being an only child for 13 years with relating more to adults. But then it was really difficult when I went to a school district where uh, they didn't celebrate diversity and it was really small and everybody knew you went to learning support. So I both, it was a really uh, hard time for me, especially in the beginning. Well, and times are different back then, right, Michelle? I mean, there was a lot of schools back then that did not celebrate diversity. So how did, knowing that you have a disability, how did that impact you internally? Like maybe with your confidence or your meeting friends or sharing or speaking up and really having a voice in different things. How did that impact you? Because I can just imagine, you know, when you're in kindergarten, Specialize an only child. I have an only child, right? So that was kind of, you know, Blaze, my only child, when he was in kindergarten, that was like his first opening to the world, if you will, right? Because before then, he had only played with cousins, people people that we knew, right? So that's his, really, as a kindergarten, a lot of times your first real opening to the world, and then you get diagnosed with a disability, wrapping your brain, you know, as a little five-year-old, even around that term and what that means, right? But then how does that start to impact you internally, recognizing that maybe you're not at as quick at math as other people, or that you're not different? You're not, I'm sorry, you're not the same as other people. How does that impact you in your confidence? I didn't have a lot of confidence when I was young. That was really hard for me. I didn't think that I could learn. I didn't think that I was smart. I was really blessed to have parents, though, that told me, well, you are smart. You just like love that. And they, and they used the term learning disability. We never really uh, danced around uh, that. that might be. It was simple, age-appropriate terms. And I think the first thing that I did that gave me that boost of self-esteem was uh, reading and writing have always been a big part of my life. And my dad used to read to me every night when I was little. Girl. And I was a fluent reader. I just struggled with reading comprehension. And I always loved to write. And I can remember I wrote my first story about a dinosaur in second or third grade. And my dad said, hey, this is really good. And from that moment oh. on, I began, I thought, wow, this is something I'm good at. And I like doing it. I just wrote from that point and read a lot of books and uh, that 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 was just one of the most inspiring things I think when I found I'm like this is something I'm good at actually. yeah but even more than that that you had the support from your family that you had the support from your parents and they said okay they embraced the disability and they also said here's other things that you're really amazing at you know whether we have a disability or not none of us are good at everything right and then just people in general tend to be good at math or good at reading writing right because of how our brains work one brain one part of our brain tends to be stronger than the other one so i love what your dad did and really encouraged and supported you on that which probably helps with why you're writing a blog now and and that kind of like helps you in different phases of your life so how did the other kids when you're growing up react to you because i know other kids even when you don't have a learning disability, sometimes are not the nicest kids, right? They can say things that yeah. can be. Uh, it was really difficult for me. I can remember when I was in elementary school, it was more you didn't get invited to a birthday party or somebody didn't want to play with you on the playground. Or I can remember wanting to have a best friend and just not always having that uh, success with that. And as I got through school, it got a lot harder. A lot of the peer groups became more defined. And I just didn't feel like I fit in with any particular one of them. And a lot of the bullying really increased. And one of the things I was able to do, though, was I uh, found a group outside of my high school in a, one of the neighboring school districts. And it was an art program where we did writing and other things. And I found some people that didn't know who I was and I could shut that revolution I had for all those years. And even when I did come forward and say, yeah, I have a learning disability, some people were like, oh, I have one too, or I know somebody and it's not, yes. you know, 
And that gave me the encouragement to kind of reach out to other groups in the community. And I found a writing group, and 20-some years later, we're still friends. We're still on a meeting once a month to, to, to write. And uh, we had a friendship that's uh, extended past the, the, that group, too. Yeah. And so that, that helped me a lot. I found my tribe. It just wasn't the peers that I went to school with. I love that. That's so empowering. And you know, what that also says, Michelle, is that no matter your situation, no matter your background, you can really be whoever you want to be. You can reinvent yourself. You just have to find the right people that are going to surround you, that are going to support you, that are going to see you for you and not the imperfections because we all have imperfections right everyone has imperfections so let people who only see those imperfections and harp on those imperfections are just not your tribe they're just not your people right finding your people who are going to embrace those imperfections and say we don't love you in spite of them we love you because of them and i think that's empowering right exactly and have someone that loves you for that but also shares a common interest too helps as well. And just finding those people and being able to just uh, meet people that it's, it's a fresh start, I think is awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you also doing those kind of things as well, build your confidence in the process too. Now, I remember you sharing with me some things that teachers had said to you along the way. What were those? I can remember I had a teacher that didn't think they could handle college. I just knew I wanted to go there, but and my grades were I had improved immensely as I got through school. School got a lot easier academically, but there was always that math disability, and I was always a learning support for that. And I had a learning support teacher that she didn't think I could handle college. And I can just remember she wanted me to go to vocational training. And a lot of my peers and learning support, that's where they went. And there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that, but nothing there interested me. And I even had peers that didn't understand why. Well, why aren't you going for the tour? And I'm like, well, it doesn't interest me. And they're like, why well, would go just to get out of school? But I thought that gave me more preparation. Mm-hmm. And I did have a wonderful student teacher at, that told me, you can go to college. You're a hard worker. You know how to study. And that just gave me that inspiration. Even when I got to school and it was really hard, sometimes that was the voice that I heard in my head. I love that. And you know, that's uh, that's so inspiring because sometimes all we need is that one voice, someone believing in us, someone saying yes, because there's always going to be those negative people around and it's easy to buy into those stories. It's easy to believe when someone says, oh, no, you can't do that, or that dream is too big, or that's not for you. You'll never succeed at that. Because guess what? Those are the things that we've told ourselves before. And so when someone says those things to us, it's like, yep, I knew it. I, I knew it. I knew you weren't going to succeed. Or I knew you couldn't do that. And it just re, it just affirms what we've been, that negativity we've been telling ourselves, those stories that have been coming up, or maybe the insecurities about ourselves. But when someone believes in us, Someone says, no, you got this. I believe in you. You can do this. You're a hard worker. You're smart. You're good at academics. You figured out a way that works for you. And great. And great. And Michelle, the way that was working for you may not work for everyone else, right? But it was working well for you. And someone believed in you. And I love how you believed that person more than that negative teacher that was saying, no, I don't think college is for you, but you believe that teacher's aid and you said, oh, okay, maybe I can do this. And so then what happened? Did you go to college? Yes, I did. I got involved with a federal agency called Office for Vocational Rehabilitation and they pay for testing. They even provide money for college. I was able to graduate at debt free, which was nice. And a lot. <laughs> but then really one of the things at that time, you had to I had to prove I had a learning disability again. There's been some recent legislation that people can go in and you can have an IEP and receive the, the same accommodations, but this was long before that was passed. Mm-hmm. And I can remember I, I ran into some resistance again with the psychiatrist. I'm not a great test taker and a lot of my scores were really low. And 
the psychiatrist didn't have a lot of faith in me. I can remember they put on there, most likely won't go beyond community college. And that was heartbreaking. I'm already afraid. I'm already, I mean, I knew that one to go. And I knew what my student teacher told me, but there, there just was that fear. And when I got to college, I had a professor that told me, well, you know, your job choices are going to be limited. And then there was a class I was in with a calculator. And I can remember them saying, oh, no, we don't use calculators here. We use our, our brains. And that was really discouraging for me. And even when I got out of the math class, because I wasn't doing well, we put that on the back burner for a while. You know, that I didn't want to use the accommodations. I didn't think, oh, it's not a math class. I don't need them. But I, I really did because my grades dropped. And there was a lot of people, even on campus, a lot of other students saying, oh, those disability accommodations, they give you an unfair advantage or they're going to box you into this category. And, and just the grades weren't doing well. And a lot of the same people who told me you shouldn't use accommodations were the ones telling me I needed to try harder and I could do better. And it was really frustrating. And finally, I was in a class I was really struggling with and telling the professor, I have a disability. And she said, why don't we at least try to get you extended test time? And I was able to get that. I passed her class. I didn't do well with it. And bunch of passed. Yeah. And, and I, I was able to pass my other classes as well. Do you want to start saying yes, but you just don't know where to start? And oftentimes when we don't know where to start, we just don't start. So we created an ebook just for you. We put together 101 ways to say yes. In this ebook, ideas big and small, things that only take a small amount of time, like one to two minutes. Whether you're saying yes to yourself, in your family, relationships, or pushing yourself lovingly outside of your comfort zone with adventures, it's all made to really help you become more of your rock star self. So you can get this ebook at thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book, B-O-O-K. So if you want to start saying yes, or maybe you need some ideas on how to say yes, because you get so caught up in being busy and doing tasks and projects or doing laundry and cooking that the time flies by and you want to spend time with your family, but you just don't know how to say yes. Those ideas just don't come to you. We put it together to make it super, super easy for you. So go to thesayyesexperience.com forward slash book to get your copy today and start saying yes now. Are you feeling overwhelmed, stressed, or burned out? We get it. You're not alone. In fact, according to our research, 79% of the workforce is in burnout and almost half are in extreme burnout. In fact, it's the number one reason why people are leaving organizations. They're burned out. They're looking for something more. They're looking for something better. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have your solution. It's called Blaze Your Brain to Extinguish Burnout. 52 Keys to Prevent, Breakthrough, and Eliminate Burnout. You can find your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. Now, this is a great tool that you can use with yourself, with your colleagues, within your organization. Everyone can get one and you can go through one a week with them. And at the end, you can say, what was something that worked this week? What was the success you had? So you can champion and encourage each other. You can also ask, what were the challenges and issues that came up? So you can mastermind and brainstorm around those to keep those from coming up in the future. So make sure you get your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. And I got, got my associate's degree in early childhood education and I moved out on my own. And that was something that was important because I don't drive because of my visual perception. So living in a central location was really helpful and all of that. And, but then financially, I had to move back in with my parents. And that was really difficult to be able to do that. It just, that was hard. I mean, losing a lot of the independence, but I thought this is the time to go back and to try to give school a try again. And when I, I found a program that interested me, had the least amount of math and science possible <laughs> and had disability accommodations. And this, I, 
I used them. That was the important thing. I had an extended, I had an extended test time. I had a note taker, and I most importantly, I advocated for myself, and my grades improved a lot. I was able to make dean's list for one semester. Most of my professors were really understanding. There's always one or two that didn't quite get it, but it, it just what um, it was a lot better. And I was able to get my bachelor's degree despite being told I couldn't do it. Good job. They sound it's amazing. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. So how were you able to push through all that cynicism, all that negativity of people saying you can't do it or it's too hard or professors not understanding because all of just hard when you have professors who understand and with a combination. So how were you able to push past all those things? I think a lot of it was having a strong support system. My parents were wonderful, but also I had great friends who they couldn't fix the disability, but they could be a friend to me. God opened up a lot of doors that, that I couldn't have passed through by myself. And it also was just using the support systems that they had in place and, and just knowing what I wanted. And that sometimes, you know, you'll know what you want and you just have to find a way to do it and it just might turn out to be different than you originally expected, but so many things turned out to be a lot better. You know, and I think that's so much, even a theme in my life, so many instances, I got a plan. I got a plan and it's, uh, things are going to be great. I got a plan and, you know, 99% of the time, 99.9% of the time, that plan does not work out the way that I, that I think, right, that I envision. But I think that that's the case for a lot of people. We set plans. We had goals in mind and we set them in motion. But along that way, life happens. Like obstacles, challenges, issues, all these things come up that we could have never predicted. Like things that, I mean, we may think challenges come up, but maybe they they come up in a different way. Or like for me, I got pregnant and had a baby and I was like, what? That wasn't in my life plan, you know, so out of wedlock, so not not a planned pregnancy. So it was like, okay, well, how are you going to adjust that? How are you going to figure that out? And sometimes, Michelle, I think those things that are not planned ends up becoming the best things that could have happened to us because think of all the things that you learned, all the lessons that you were taught, being just you finding your strength. And one of the things that you said that I think is so important for everyone in their own lives is you advocated for yourself. So tell us a little bit about that process. How did you start doing that? What did you learn from doing that? Right. I started uh, telling my professors because I would have a sheet that would have the, dis they would get a memo like, okay, this is Michelle. She has uh, such and such a disability. And this is what she, accommodation she uh, she'll be using, but it was up to me to be go up to the person and tell them. So I would usually come up and just introduce myself to a new professor and just uh, tell them my name and tell them that I had a learning disability and these are the supports that I would be using. That's how that began. And what I do uh, at now, I still have to do the same thing. Like at my job, I have to uh, tell if I have a new teacher that I'm working with. I might have to go up and say, okay, I have a le learning disability in math. I cannot help with math and even some science. It's just not, it's not, not going to work out with helping with that. And most people are pretty understanding about it. And I might even say I need extra time on just understanding directions and just new concepts. And it's just very important to go up and be very clear, go, you know, privately tell somebody what you need and, and speak on the positive terms of the things you can do yeah. rather than things that you can't necessarily. But yeah, the college was my first experience with doing that. Michelle, I think that's so important for everyone because oftentimes we expect people to know about us and they have no idea, right? They have no idea, but we expect people to know things. So I think that's so empowering for you, but that you're sharing that with us today, because I think everyone can learn to advocate for themselves better, yes. to speak up for what they need, for what they want, for what's important for them, because we all come to this point in our lives, different experiences, different situations, different backgrounds. And even without disabilities, we tend to think other people know what we're thinking, right? right. And so we need to advocate for ourselves and especially 
if you have a disability or if your child has a disability, definitely advocate for yourself, advocate for your children. But just in anything that we want, right. tend to forget and we tend to think, well, people are just going to know that that's how I think or that's what I need. No, they don't. You need to make sure that you share that with them. And look, because you've advocated for yourself all the success that you have because of that. That's so inspiring. Thank you so much. Yeah, so so as a teacher's aide, so people had said you're never going to get, you're never going to go to college, you sh- you're not going to succeed in college. College isn't for you. And he said, you're never going to graduate from college. We looked at going to college, way into college. They said, finding work is going to be hard. It, um, you're a teacher's aide, which is amazing. It's also so incredible because you're able to give back and help people that are similar to you. So how do you feel about basically breaking breaking all the what people are saying in half and saying, no, no, and then basically proving them wrong and that you're able to do all these things? I, I think it's a feeling of pride, but it's also a feeling of wanting to give back to other people that, that have disabilities to be an encouragement to them and have that connection. And I think when I work with students that have disabilities, I work with seventh graders. And a lot of times it's like, here you're reporting on myself at that age. I don't like my IEP. I wish I didn't have a disability. And I get that chance to go in and say, you know, it's okay to have a disability. And it's all right to have your IEP. It's here to help you. And nothing gives me greater joy is whenever I get to study uh, spelling words with the student. And we, we begin the week with not knowing what the words are, being really discouraged. And slowly, every day, they get better. And then at the end of the week, they'll say, I got an A or I got a B on the test. And I think uh, that, yeah, it's so rewarding. Or when we begin the school year uh, with something like organizing your backpack. Mm-hmm. And they have papers everywhere <laughs> right after a few uh, after a few weeks. And we, we take the folders and we label them and we put the papers in. And you know, this is how we organize them. And now that we're towards the end of the year, They'll come to us and they'll say, do you have an extra folder I can do for this? I, and no. we're, I give them the folder and I'm like, okay, you're taking those skills that I've showed you from yes. getting it now. And also showing them how to advocate. I've had students that, uh, that have come in that have needed help and they were afraid to ask for it. And mm-hmm. I said, well, this is what we do when we're in that situation. And the students would go and ask for the help that they needed. And sure enough, they, they got it and yes. it was successful. I love that. So what's IAP stand for? Individual Education Plan. Okay. I love it. So in in helping them really do that. So you're actually going in and teaching them skills for life, Michelle, is what you're doing. Like organizing their backpack is not just about organizing their backpack, right? You're teaching them organizing skills for life. And that's so vital no matter where they go and what they do in life. Mm -hmm. And, And then you're helping them have a sense of pride and than what they do and really uh, really championing themselves and saying, oh, I thought you got next day, cheering themselves on, hey, look how awesome I did. And so you're helping, you're helping them do that and you're making life easier for them and helping them really pave the way to success in their life, whatever that looks like in their life. Yeah, so that's definitely what I love, that I love to do is that, you know, just connecting and helping to, to get them ready, not just for the next grade, but getting them ready for life. Yeah, and asking. Asking is so powerful. Like advocating for themselves, but asking for what they need and when they want. I mean, us as humans just need to get better at being able yeah. to ask. Ask, ask. How did you learn to ask for your for things for yourself so well? How did you learn that skill? Well, when I was young, my parents advocated for me. My mom was great for talking to people on the phone about my disability and. I thought, oh, wow, she's really good at this. And sure enough, I had to do that after a certain point. And it was just through a lot of practice. And sometimes, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was hard. And I didn't do a great job at advocating for myself. And I might have come off as not uh, being positive and not getting what I want. Or I was really frustrated. But it, it was just a skill that I had to learn how to ask and how to do it in a, in a polite but definitely um, a way that I was able to express my needs. And it, it just took time. It was a process in doing it. Absolutely. So what do you want to share with people 
two two different things I want you to share. What do you want people to get out of this? People who have a disability, what do you want them to learn from you? And then what do you want to share with people who don't have a disability? Because I still believe there's a lot that Mm -hmm. we all can learn from you, whether we have a disability or not. So really two, two different questions I'm asking. Sure. I would like to encourage people that have disabilities to know what they want and to find a way to do it. That's definitely something. And I would also give the same advice to people who don't have disabilities, is to really know what you would like to do and just just be able to find a way. And for both people that success can come, it just may come in a different package. And usually that one is a lot better than the first idea. Right. And also I love I loved your perspective on advocating for yourself and asking for what you want because yes. people can't read our minds, right? People can't read our minds. And also persevering through those challenges that come up because if you have listened to all the people in your life that you were around that said, no, you shouldn't do that or you can't do that or that's not going to be successful, you know, your life would look completely different, but you had this strong support system around you. They supported you, but then you also listened to yourself and you did, you put in the work, but you also listened to yourself and believed in yourself that you could do it and that you could succeed. And I think that's a powerful message as well. Yes, definitely. Yep. I agree. So thank you so much for being here, Michelle. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And I want you to think about what you're going to take away from Michelle, from what Michelle has said and implement in your own life to really start asking for what you want, advocating for yourself and finding success, no matter what that looks like. And oftentimes it might be different than what you envisioned for yourself. We'll see you next time. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Are you ready to move to your next level of rockstar greatness? CFO, Chief Fun Officer, number one best-selling author, and keynote speaker, Blaze Rector, is ready to help you do that. At just 10 years old, he's already written two number one best-selling books. Through the power of storytelling, he uses lessons learned and shares strategies, tips, tactics, and tools to inspire, empower, and motivate you to live a more amazing life. So if you're ready to do that in your own life, grab a copy of his number one best-selling books at justcorrector.com forward slash store. And when you order your copies, he will personally autograph them and write you a message on those books before shipping them out to you to really inspire and empower you in your life. These books are great for adults, and kids alike. So if you're ready to move to your next level of rock star greatness, make sure you grab your copy at justcorrector.com forward slash store. Enjoy those amazing, empowering, transformational books. Did you know that the two biggest issues impacting the workforce are mental health and burnout? Well, we have your solution. The more that you feel burned out, the more it impacts your mental health. The more your mental health is impacted, the more it leads to burnout. So it's a vicious cycle that goes around and around, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can help them both if you're intentional and strategic with it. We have lots of resources for you at justcorrector.com forward slash store. One that I wanna highlight that really enhances your mental health is Tame Your Brain Game, 52 tips to turn negative thoughts into positive action. Now, research shows that 80% of your thoughts are negative. No matter how positive you feel, it's the pattern and the habit that you've developed over the course of years, over the course of decades. And that can often impact your life, how you show up, how you lead, how you communicate, how you engage, whether at work or at home. And then it also impacts a work environment. All you need is one NN or TT, negative Nancy or toxic Tim to really impact that work environment. So if you are ready to enhance your mental health, get your copy of Tame Your Brain Game, 52 tips to turn negative thoughts into positive action today at justcorrector.com forward slash store. All books are autographed with a personal message just for you. Thank you so much for being here. Check us out at thesayyesexperience.com. Our mission at the Say Yes Experience is to empower 10 million people to say yes. 
with your help in sharing our podcast, we can do that. Follow us on all social media at the Say Yes Experience and join our free community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the Say Yes Experience. Thank you again to our guest. You can find all the contact information for our guest in the show notes. Thank you to our CFO, Chief Fund Officer, Blaze Rector, our business advisor, Lisa Rehurek, and to our team at Jessica Rector Enterprises. We look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Have an amazing day and keep being a rock star. Oh, 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 oh